Good evening, University family. I hope I find you all well and healthy in these crazy times. Hopefully you're all staying sane so that we can come back together and, and meet very shortly here um, and not all go crazy. Um, we're going to open up with some, some praise and worship this morning, but I wanted to start by reading you the chorus of one of the songs that we're going to sing. Uh, we're going to be singing Be Thou My Vision, um, and the, the chorus of this version goes, In my darkest day, be my strength and song. Be the light of peace, singing evermore. Let my eyes see all that you have in store. Be thou my vision, be thou my vision, Lord. I feel like this is a very, very important thing to, to keep in our minds as we go about our days, especially right now, where we have to rely on the Lord to be our strength, um, and to let His light shine through us. It's not it's not our job. Um, we must rely on Him and put our faith in Him to to do all of that, um, because He is Lord and He is the only one that can do that. So, with that in mind, let's worship. Would you sing with us?
guys, thank you for joining us for another week of Encounter. We're so excited that you all make some time and hang out with us. Uh, thank you again to Jimmy and the team for another amazing week of worship with some true bops in there. Uh, so today for our small group video, we're going to kick it over to Catherine and she's got an amazing story, so check it out. Hey Marcy, my name is Catherine. I'm one of the co-leaders for one of the small group studies that we have. Um, I have like the honor and privilege to lead it with uh, a great co-leader, Eric. Um, every Wednesday at 5.30, we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you don't know what that is, um, it's basically why life is meaningless. Um, yeah, so, but next week, though, however, we're actually going to get to the conclusion of the book, and we're going to actually talk about the meaning of life. So, um, even if you weren't there the entire um, semester, we would love to have you at the last um, study where we talk about, basically, the meaning of life. Um, and so, this is what kind of my family and I have been up to in quarantine, and so, I'm just gonna show you real quick what we do. We're gonna make, I'm gonna show you how we do pupusas. And so this right here is called masa. It is corn mix mixed in with water. So what you wanna do is you wanna grab a ball, make sure you have enough of it. You want it to be pretty big, cause you want a big pupusa, you don't want a tiny pupusa. Um, and so I call you, make it in a ball. And this is like the trick, uh, this is like the tricky part. Um, it took me like years to learn, but basically what you do is you grab the ball and then you start squeezing the middle like this and then with this other hand you start squeezing the outside like that and you just go around and around and around and around until you kind of make it flat it's no longer a ball but you don't want it too thin you want it thick and so then you start smacking it with your hand so you go like this like you're punching it kind of and you just want to make like a concave space where you could put in the filling which is right here so once you have the concave filling what we have here, this is chicharron and queso, um, I mean chicharron and cheese, um, and this right here is just bean and cheese. Um, the beans and everything's already cooked, um, you just have to put it in. And so yeah, so what we're what I'm going to, what I'm doing is going to be revueltas, and so you're going to put the chicharron in, make sure you have enough of it, because um, you want enough filling. And then you go in here, you grab some of the frijoles, put it on top. And then what you're going to do is you're going to start like coming back into a ball. And so you just kind of want to cocoon around the filling. And then as you can see, you just want to push in the masa on in. So you could close it. It's so, like seal it. And if you need like more masa, you could just go in and get some. If you have like cracks and stuff. Again, now you, once you have it filled in, you roll it again. Smooth out all the cracks because the cracks is where like the pollen rises. You don't want the filling to come out. So again, once again, as you can see, I'm rolling it. And then what we just did to make the ball into like a flat shape, that's what we're gonna do again. So I just grab it and then pushing in the middle, tucking in the outsides. And then you don't have to worry about making it like too thin. Um, you don't wanna do that at this stage. What you, now what I'm gonna show you is that what I'm gonna like do is I'm gonna like push the insides and seal it. So I'm gonna go like this. As you can see, I make the outsides with my palm, like sealed, like thin, right? Don't worry about the middle, we'll don't worry, we'll just like fix that later. But um, I call it then, like once you have the outside sealed, we're going to go here to the coman. I don't know what's in English, we call it coman. Um, but you just back it down and then you just start pushing outside. And then you see it comes more to the flat um, shape that you want. Do, do, do. You want to make sure that it's, this is the part where you kind of want to make sure it kind of gets thinner. Um, not too thick. You want to make sure everything gets cooked evenly. Um, don't worry, like if you're afraid about being your like hot stuff, don't be scared. Like it's, you just get over it. It's fine. Anyways. Uh, and then, so yeah, once you have it done, 
you just wait until like this side on the bottom side starts getting cooked um you kind of know and if you see in this pupusa like the sides just kind of need a little longer to be cooked um how i call it yeah just a little bit longer you don't have to be scared and so once you once this like side has like a golden brown color then that's when you know when to flip it and then you just repeat the same process on the other side and then this is just like your final products these are bufusas salvadorian style um and it kind of sucks that we're not that we're in quarantine because then like i'll give you one but you know we're not so you could just make it yourself um, so thank you guys. Um, hope you guys stay safe during quarantine. And if you get like bored and you're like, I want to make something, you can make a bubusa. All right then. So, bye guys. Well, thank you so much, Kathy, for an amazing video about what's going on in your small group. Uh, and so, you know, we not only like to show on what's going on in small groups, but also what people are up to at home. So this week, my favorite dog, Toby Morales. Make sure to follow him. His handle will be in the link. Uh, we're gonna see what him and. Josue and Karen are up to too, I guess. So check it out. Hey, diversity, it's Karen. I just wanted to say hi to you guys live from quarantine in Las Vegas. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. And I hope everyone's doing good in their classes too. We only have three more weeks. Like, we got this. Um, so, yeah, just a quarantine update. Um, I'm doing good, you know, staying at home, chilling, procrastinating, seeking the Lord sometimes. So yeah, um, literally just been at home, really bored, but try to make the most out of it. And Josue's doing good too, he's in the room next to me, he won't be my video. But yeah, I just wanted to say hi to you guys, and I hope that everyone's doing good, and I can't wait to see everyone once quarantine's over. Bye! All right, guys. Well, for those who don't know, in Avarsi Live, the musical part four is happening tonight. And so they are finishing all on the theme of uh, what kind of the world needs right now. So uh, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, make sure to follow the link in our Instagram bio to sign up. And then we have a discussion group that happens right after. So that's this Friday, April 24th. Uh, got the date. Don't worry, guys. Uh, so make sure if that sounds interesting to you. Check it out and then join us to discuss what the message is all about afterwards. All right, guys, well, really exciting announcement we have coming up is we are going to have an InterVarsity Talent Show on May 8th on YouTube at 7 o'clock. So we really want to show you, you know, what talents you guys all have, like me. I'm all cool. I'm in the tree. Maybe your talent is climbing trees in under five minutes. Because that's the thing, guys. All the time limits are about five minutes per video. Uh, if you're like, oh, but I have a really cool magic act that lasts six minutes, go ahead and text Jimmy, and you guys can kind of talk through what that might look like. So... You know, let's see, University Got Talent, decide to see what you guys can all do. Like me, tree time. All right, guys, well, we had so much fun and we had our Jackbox party last Friday that we're like, hey, what if we just do it again? Because we got, we didn't even get to like half the games. And I think there's like three more party packs for us to explore. So this Friday, we're gonna have another Jackbox party. So same deal as before, make sure to tune in at seven into our Discord and let's have fun, play some fun games and Let's see who's the funniest of them all. It's gonna be me. Alright guys, well so today for After Varsity we're gonna be playing some more Jackbox game, kinda get us ready not only for uh, tomorrow, but you know, just cause it's lots of fun, we can play some more games, maybe some of the favorites that you guys had, uh, so make sure to stick around for that. And without further ado guys, it is my great pleasure to tell you guys that one of my really good friends, A1 since day one, or day one of seventh grade I guess, uh, Sarah Tribble is gonna come ask for the killer message, so go ahead guys and check her out. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Um, welcome to Encounter, you know. We're doing only bringing you the best quality streaming services for this. Um, you are coming out live from my apartment, so <laughs> this should be a really interesting encounter. Um, yeah, I know, they have been very weird and interesting lately. Um, but in case you don't know me, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm actually in my last semester here at UNLV, and it has been a wild last semester. <laughs> Um, I'm a social work major and I just finished all my hours to like officially graduate so very excited about that. Um, and yeah, I've been going to InterVarsity for about like a year, a year and a half. Um, I had a lot of friends that were involved and I actually really didn't get involved until like the tail end. 
Um, but now I'm here and I get to give a message for you guys. So I'm super excited about that. Um, in tradition with like how we usually do encounter, I have to answer a few questions I know right off the bat. So first of all, my favorite 3 a.m. snack is actually like putting together like this like ramen dish that I kind of like invented that like makes regular like packets of ramen like better. Follow my Instagram, maybe I'll post the recipe, you know. Um, <laughs> um, I don't have any weird talents, I don't think. I can kind of sing sometimes. Um, and a weird fun fact about me is that I have six brothers. Yeah, in case like you didn't know that, uh, yeah, I have six brothers. So it's kind of complicated how it kind of works with my family because I have a half brother who's actually 16 years older than me um, from my dad's first marriage. Then I have two brothers, one older and one younger from both of my parents. And then later on when my mom got remarried, I got three more stepbrothers. So like majority of my life is kind of spent with my two brothers but then I also had this other brother and then I added more brothers later in my life so if you can like imagine that's like a really crazy way to kind of like grow up and live life especially as like the only female in that equation um and, and as you can like imagine like if you're a sister who has brothers and like mostly brothers you know like you have to like fight kind of tough you gotta be tough, you gotta get ready to kind of get thrown around and like punched and like ready, you know? And, and I, I was always like used to rough play, you know, me and my brother Luke were the closest in age, so like we definitely like roughhoused once, uh, once or twice, um, kind of going around things. Um, but let me ask you this, did you guys ever have a moment where your sibling almost killed you because they were being super irresponsible? No, just me? Okay, well, I had a moment like this when I was a kid, and my brother Luke legit, like, almost killed me on, like, multiple occasions. So, what happened was, what happened was, sorry, I couldn't resist, was what had happened is we were, I think, he was six and I was five, and we spent a lot of time at, like, the community swimming pool when we were a kid. You know, those, like, gated things and, like, apartment communities where, like, everybody can kind of go swim? So we were off there and my brother Luke learned how to swim like really early and I was like terrified of the water when I was a kid which is weird because I really love the water now but like as a kid I like would not go near it I was like really afraid and so my brother thought it would be hilarious to get me to the deep end of a pool and to push me in yeah and if you can't like imagine or like don't know how like physics work, I didn't know to swim and I was a really little kid. So I sank like completely to the bottom. Like didn't know how to float, didn't have floaties on. Quite frankly, we probably should have been more supervised, but I sank to the bottom. And guys, I'm gonna be honest, I can recall this memory because it was so terrifying for me. Um, like, it was the first time in my life that I, I one ever felt like actually in danger because you know I was only like five and I, I learned what it felt like to not know how to breathe and to be in a situation where it was just so pitch black and dark that like you didn't know how to escape it. Um, fun fact I lived, spoiler alert just in case you didn't, didn't put that together. Um, so I'm like going through this like major childhood trauma right now while I'm sitting at the bottom of this dark pool. But like what I didn't know is the whole time my dad had been watching from across the pool and he came to get me right in time, no brain damage, no nothing like that. Um, and obviously I turned out okay. Yeah, um, I was really fortunate when I was a kid that I had a dad who loved me very much and who was watching me and wanted the best for me and so was always getting us out of situations like that when, um, you know, me and my brother would mess something up or, you know, get into a dangerous situation. My dad was always there to kind of have my back. Um, and it was really unfortunate as I kind of got older because my dad passed away when I was about 12 years old really, really suddenly and I started kind of getting into this dark place in my life without anybody to come out and rescue me. So I really struggled throughout my childhood with just a bunch of really dark situations. Um, 
not only like did I lose my dad, I lost a lot of family members at a really young age, right around the same time, um, including my aunt, my grandparents, and my great aunt, who I loved very much. They all kind of just passed away at the same time, um, which was really difficult for me. I really struggled with mental illness when I was a kid. I was severe anxiety, depression um, growing up and already like didn't really feel like my family was together. And I kind of was just like dealing with all of these things. Um, growing up and I felt that it wasn't really until I entered college that I had to really deal with all the things that had kind of happened to me and through the course of my life um, and they all kind of just piled up to this one time <laughs> in my life that ended up just being full of darkness and that was around the beginning of 2009 right around when I started coming to university I was just in this place of having to look at my life and decide who I want to be in in spite of kind of all of the things that I had gone through. And so 2009 was crazy for me because I had just started an internship. I was in a really bad relationship I shouldn't have been in. Um, I decided to move out of my parents' house. So I was dealing with that for the first time in my life um, just because of some drama that went on and I just wanted to leave. And then um, you know, all of my friends had moved to another state and I just kind of, on top of all of these crazy things, I found myself in this situation where I suddenly didn't have a job and I didn't really know, um, how I was gonna like pay my rent or go to school or manage all this time and manage to live on my own and all of these crazy things are going on in my life and then boom, Right in the summer of 2019, I end up getting diagnosed with a really bad um, chronic condition. So um, in 2009, in the summer, I ended up getting hospitalized for a long, it felt like a long time to me, but I think it was only about a week and a half um, in the hospital. And they discovered that I have this rare form of bone cancer known as CML or chronic melanoid leukemia. Um, and for those of you who don't know what CML is, it makes perfect sense because it's a super rare one in a billion chance of getting something like this. Um, and when I mean one in a billion, that's like actually the statistics on it, it's one in a billion. Um, usually people who get it are old and already sick and dying, and they're usually older males. And so it was really like a crazy phenomenon for me to even get this disease in the first place. It came along with um, really just a lot of changes that had to go into my life. I suddenly found out that I would have to go through chemotherapy, which I'm still doing. Um, and the results of chemo really take a toll on your body. They make you really sick some days and tired and it limits the amount of energy that you can kind of give. Um, the first couple weeks I was on chemo, I had such bad bone pain in my legs that it was really hard to walk around. I remember I was in bed a lot um, and I actually questioned whether or not I'd be able to get up and be functional. And I just, kind of sank into this place where I was like I don't understand God why if you've called me to a purpose if you've loved me if you've been with me my whole life like why would I end up in this with this like horrible condition I almost felt like I was being cursed and stopped from doing the things that God kind of wanted me to do um and just kind of like that moment when I was a little kid I kind of found myself having this moment like when I was at the bottom of the pool where I didn't really know what was going on. I was more afraid than I could ever describe. I was surrounded by darkness, but this time I didn't feel like anybody was there to pull me out. Um, and I kind of just sank into this place of fear and anxiety and not knowing. And all I could ask was God to save me. I just kept asking like, God, I don't know what you want me to do with this. I don't know where I am. I don't know how I'm gonna even live on my own, how I'm gonna keep going to college, how I'm gonna do any of these things. Like, God, can you please just intervene in my life and find a way, um, just find a way when I didn't feel like there was another way. Um, 
But let me tell you something that I didn't know in that time is that God is a perfect father. And just like my dad was watching me from across the pool and getting ready to pull me out when I was a little kid, God the father was watching what I was going through and was getting ready to save me in a mighty way and to pull me out of the things that I've been experiencing. Um, so all these crazy bad things happen and then going into 2020 and the end of 2019 even, God just was so mighty in my life and the way that he intervened. Um, number one, the cancer treatment that I'm supposed to have is in, it's a hundred dollars a session and I have to do it every single day to live. And I was really, really worried about the cost of that. And somehow by a miracle of God, it's free. I pay nothing. There was an advocacy group that called on my behalf to my insurance company and literally made my chemo treatments free. Number one, big hallelujah. Two, I was living in an apartment. I didn't know how I was going to make any rent, how I was going to pay for anything. Um, and a really close family member called and was just heard that I had cancer and just was like, hey, I just feel like I need to pay your rent. And he paid off my rent for like so many months just so like I could recover and to recuperate. And I wasn't even that close to my family. So to have like a distant relative just call and just wanna bless me in that way was huge. Um, and then eventually when I started getting my strength up from chemo, I had a really cool job opportunity given to me by a friend of mine that pays plenty enough for me to work and to live and to stay at home and to rest and to recuperate from anything that I might be going through. And it's also something that really relates to my field of study that I'm really excited to do. Third thing. Fourth thing. Um, I got out of that really crappy relationship and instead of being heartbroken, I realized that God was trying to do a greater work in me and reveal things to me that I couldn't see. And God literally saved me from this like horrible abusive thing that I, like, I didn't even understand was going on and decided to give me something better and to restoring me and working on me through my singleness, um, which is a big hallelujah. And now I'm sitting here in this time and all I wanna preach on is that God is mighty to save. He was mighty enough to save me from cancer, from mental illness, from the pain of being lonely and not feeling like I had family, to restoring my life and bringing me to this place where I'm not only about to graduate from college, but I got accepted into a really great master's program with my GPA and I'm gonna be really successful. Um, and I'm blessed beyond compare. And it's not even that God took away some of the circumstances that were going on, but that God was mighty enough to come in and intervene in me and to change things in me that were going on. Um, and so today I want to talk about the story of Hagar and how God is so mighty to save. And just like God was mighty to save in my life, um, he uses examples of that in scripture to encourage us all. So I know that we all have faced darkness in our life and that we all need God to be mighty to save us from something that is going on within us. And so I hope this story just encourages you and that I can share something with you that um, is really going to comfort you guys in this time. So let's hop into that. So today I'm going to be looking at Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 16, looking at verses 7 through 13, and I'm going to break it by piece by piece for y'all. Um, hopefully you have a Bible in front of you or some way of following along. Sorry, I don't have any like cool screens with words on them or anything, but um, we're gonna get through this and it's gonna be great. So <laughs> I wanna start with some background for the story of who Hagar is and kind of just setting the scene for everything. So Hagar is actually a slave for two people um, or a servant, some translations might say, for, um, 
Abram and Sarai. And the reason those two names probably sound really familiar to a lot of you is because Abram eventually becomes Abraham and Sarai eventually becomes Sarah. And they have their own really cool little story that um, happens after this, which like highly recommend checking out, but it's actually time to talk about Hagar. So what ends up happening here is Abram and Sarai get promised by God that they are gonna have descendants more than the number of stars that are in the sky. And so they're waiting all of these years so that way God delivers this promise to them. But what's crazy is, is that they're kind of getting into old age where Sarai is not really going to be able to have any more kids or able to have kids at all. Um, and so they're kind of starting to doubt God's promises. They're getting frustrated and upset. And so they look to um, Hagar. And as the slave, she has no choice but to listen to whatever they requested. And so Sarai comes up with this kind of little scheme here where she just says to Abram, why don't you just sleep with Hagar and have a baby and then legally in it under law it would become our kid and then we can raise it and then we can try to you know get what we want so I don't know if like you guys have ever picked up on this this is like the part in Sunday school where they usually like skip over this story when it comes to um <laughs> Abram and Sarai they usually skip to where they have baby Isaac and it's just oh god fulfilled this promise but like they don't talk about the like really messed up thing that they decide to do with this dynamic with their servant I mean guys this would be like the equivalent of like a, a, the rich older couple couldn't really have kids and they just look at the guy and they're like, why don't you just sleep with our gardener and then we can have a baby that way. That sounds insane. And that just seems like a really bad method of like asking for a surrogate. <laughs> so um, as funny as like I try to make that sound, it actually was really dumb. And of course, you know, Ab Abram <laughs> agrees to this and is like, okay, whatever, and decides to go through with this. But let me tell you guys why... Um, on a, like a more serious level, why for three reasons, this was actually like extreme sin in their lives and was ultimately just a really, really bad idea. So number one, they would actually be sitting against God in this situation because God said that he would fulfill a promise to them if they were faithful. And instead of being faithful, Sarai is deciding to take things into her own hands and she wants to kind of force this outcome that she was wishing that God would create. Um, it's also sinful against God because they're going outside of their marriage. They made a vow to one another to only be with one another. And Sarai is actually encouraging her husband to sleep with someone else in this circumstance and to break that vow of their marriage and to basically commit adultery with another woman. Um, obviously, this is before surrogates and technology and things like that. So I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. But within this context, she is encouraging him to sleep with someone else. And it's kind of messed up. Um, two, um, or I'm sorry, three, actually, the third reason is really messed up because, you know, one, it's a sin against God's promise. Two, it's a sin because they're committing adultery. And three, this is like the big thing here, guys. It's a sin against Hagar because she is a servant and more like culturally appropriate a slave at this time. She can't say no. So yeah, you guys heard me right. It's not like they have this meeting where Hagar and Sarai and Abram like all sit down and talk about, you know, would you like to be involved in this situation? It, it, it's, it's completely taking advantage of her. Um, and what's crazy is the situation kind of turns around back on Hagar somehow, where she's just simply being obedient and doing what it is that they requested. Um, and Sarai ends up becoming outrageously jealous when she becomes pregnant with Abram's baby. And so we got some like drama here, okay? People act like the Bible is like boring or whatever. But guys, the Old Testament, we literally have like some baby mama drama stuff going on. I mean, I'm serious. This is for real. So, <laughs> but Hagar here is just trying to do the right thing. Sarai gets really outraged with jealousy and ends up being really, really harsh to her to the point where Hagar is really, really afraid for her life. And so she decides to flee into the wilderness. And here's where we find Hagar in our encounter with God. Um, and so we are going to hop into verse 7. So we're in Genesis 16, verse 7. And it says, The angel of the Lord found her by the spring in the wilderness, the spring of the valley of Shar. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing my mistress Sarai. So the first kind of like 
main thing I want to point out with these couple verses is that the way that God is so mighty to save us and our lives is that he is a God who pursues us. You see, Hagar runs out into the wilderness and she's full of fear and anxiety. She's pregnant. She has nowhere to go. But God is sending someone along her side to follow her, to see her through it. At no point did God leave Hagar alone or decide to just let her fall into the hands of sins of other people. But instead, she is being pursued by God and seen by God. So that's a really, really cool thing going on in these verses. And a really cool observation that... Um, I was able to kind of research and see what was going on here is that we see this angel is actually the one that's sent before Hagar instead of God himself. And this is actually the first time an angel appears to anybody in the Bible. Um, and guys, sending an angel to somebody in, throughout scripture is a moment that is so sacred and so special and unique and is usually only given to people who have had a very special place in God's heart or a special moment of destiny or like a really specific um, plan that God has for them. So it's so cool to see an angel. The first angel in scripture appears to a woman who is pregnant without a father and sitting in the middle of a wilderness and is this slave girl who people would probably look down on in her society, but instead God is choosing to send an angel to her. And I just thought that was really special. Um, also, I just want to point out the fact that Hagar takes this like a champ. Usually when angels show up to people in the Bible, they're all like, do not be afraid of me. But Hagar's just kind of like, yeah what's going on? Like, I feel like she just has this, like, such a cool response to seeing an angel for the first time. So, like, Hagar's already did this pretty cool trick. Um, and it's just so powerful the way that God is speaking to her, that he knows where she's going. The angel's asking these questions so that way he can have a personal experience with her. Um, but really, God knew because he sent an angel exactly where she was. So, God knew a whole time where she was going and what she was doing and was here to help her. So verse nine says, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for, mu for multitude. So what's really cool that's happening here is we see that like God is giving Hagar direction of a place to go. And so this might be really confusing to some of you because she just ran away from like this really abusive situation and now God is actually telling her to go back. Um, but what we don't understand unless we look into scripture is that this is actually saving Hagar's life. So Hagar is a slave. So that means that she at the time only could belong to Abram and Sarai. So it's not like she could go out and get a job or like make a name for herself. Like there was no really way for her to have a means of survival at all, especially because she was a woman in the time. Women were only allowed to work and have legal representation and a life through the men that they married. And at this point, since she was already pregnant out of wedlock, she would already not be able to get married to another husband, even if he was a slave slave and she wouldn't be able to provide for herself at all or making a living for anything so if she went out into the wilderness like she was planning on doing her and her baby probably would have died because of the harsh circumstances um and so god is actually recreating a plan for her within the midst of all these things that are going on to ensure her survival and to ensure the life of her and her child so even though it seems kind of crazy to send her back to abram and sarai god is actually seeing things that hagar can't see um, also, it's really important to note that when he states this, that I will surely multitude your offspring so they cannot be numbered for the multitudes, that God isn't just sending her back in despair or fear, but God is sending her back with a promise. God is saying that I have a better plan than what you are currently going through, and I'm going to show you, Hagar, what I can create out of your circumstance. And so this brings me to kind of my second point within the passage today. God is so mighty to save us because God is bigger than our circumstances. So if we look at the story of Hagar, we see what she's going through. God is not leaving her alone. God is not just throwing her into something that she can't handle or something that is, isn't going to prosper her or show her something new. God is promising her to make something out of what she's going through. And I think what's 
really, really important here is that God sometimes, when it comes to our own lives, we want God to radically change our circumstance or even get us out of our circumstance. But really, what God is trying to do is God is trying to change you in the middle of your circumstances. Sometimes we want God to change our circumstance, but what God really needs is to change you and what's going on in your heart to be different and to be made new, to look to Him, to have faith and to have a way to look towards his plan and what he has designed for you so that way you will not be discouraged. You won't go running off into the wilderness and you won't do something that's ultimately going to stop your fate. So we move on to verses 11 and 12. And guys, this is where it gets kind of weird and kind of confusing, but I promise I'm here to help you out, okay? So here's what it says. The angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and you will bear a son. You will call him Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. First of all, it's really cool. But this is where it gets kind of weird. So, he shall be a wild donkey of a man. He will raise his hand against everyone and everything who's against him. And then he shall dwell again over against all his kinsmen. So, basically, along with this awesome promise that like God is giving her to have descendants and have a legacy and to prosper, he's also kind of giving her a warning about how her son's kind of going to be wild like a donkey. But it's going to be okay. <laughs> So we kind of have, again, another crazy circumstance for Hagar, but here's what's so beautiful is just that God is working so deeply in spite of it, that God is saying there's going to be struggles. There are going to be things that are going to be difficult. You're going to raise this son and things might not work out and you're going to have to live with these people that are kind of crazy, but I am here to help you prosper and I'm here to change you and to just create you into what you need to be, Hagar, because he loves he loves Hagar like a daughter and God is just being this awesome, perfect father figure here where he is seeing what's ahead, he's preparing her and he's loving her. Um, I also really love how in this verse it talks about um, that that God sees her in her afflictions, that the word Ishmael is being broken down into God heard you, that God hears your cry for help and then he's answering it by the way that these things are gonna work out. So there's being promises made in spite of circumstance over and over again for Hagar, which is really special and just wonderful. Um, so God just wanted to fill her. Um, just fill her with just these promises and goodness as a response to her faith in him. And I think that we can also find rest and comfort in that, that often it's faith that is grounding people and moving us forward. That, you know, with everything that's going on in our lives right now, with the changing unknown patterns of the world, God might not be changing this circumstance for us yet, but God is changing us. God is doing a change in us to create more faith, to give promises of the good things that are to come and to not let us go out into despair, into our own plans. But instead, God is trying to use this time to redirect us and bring us back to a time of faith, which I just hope we really lean in on. Um, moving forward into the last bit of scripture that I have for you guys. So this is verses 13 through 14. Oh, I'm sorry, just 13. So we're going into verses 13, and here's what it says. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. So Hagar's response to all the things that God is doing in her life is basically like this breakthrough aha moment of, God, you are not distant in my circumstance, but you see me. You're the God who knows exactly what I'm going through and, and is here to rescue me. Um, and this kind of brings me to my third point about how God is so mighty to save us in our lives is that God is a God of seeing and God sees you and me just like he saw Hagar in her circumstances. I think um, what's really cool is when you break down the Hebrew word for what she was saying is it's actually this uh, word and it's El Roy is what she calls God. It's a special meaning and a name for God that only Hagar ends up calling God. And it's the only time we see this anywhere in the Bible of someone calling God El Rai. And it means that you are the God who sees me, that you know me ultimately and intimately, and you see every single part of me. 
And it just creates such this special and blessed relationship between Hagar and God. This just incredible intimacy where she calls him this by this new name and you can tell that she's being renewed in her heart. Um, and I think we can take just such a great lesson from this year where God is so mighty that he sees you in a way that nobody else can and that he understands you in a way that nobody else can, that God is God of seeing, which means that he sees layers of your heart that you don't even see. He can see the past, present, future all simultaneously. And so he knows things about you that you might not even discovered about yourself yet, that he is looking ahead into your circumstance. He is intimate in your life. He has not gone away from you and he is here to work with you just like he is with him. Hagar just meeting this poor, pregnant, destitute woman right where she was in the middle of chaos. God is here to meet you in the same way. Um, and so I guess this just from all of this that I'm going over with you guys today, the thing that I want you to know the most is to just have faith in a God who is mighty to save you because our God has proven time and time again through scripture, through my story, through our own lives that he is mighty to save us and that he wants to save you in your own life today. So my question for you today is where does God need to come in and be mighty to save you? Where are those circumstances in your life that you are crying out, that you need to know that God is mighty to save you, that he is bigger than your circumstances, that God understands your circumstances, and that ultimately he sees you and understands you in a way that nobody else can in the middle of everything so that he can be mighty enough to save you. And if you're having any doubts, I just want to reassure you that God is so mighty that not only did he create this world, but he understands it, sees it in a way that you will never see it, but he also was big enough and mighty enough to destroy hell and sin when he sent Jesus to die on the cross for everything that we had been going through, that God knew us, he saw us, he knew that we would need a savior. And so he planned this just a beautiful love story for us through time, through the Old Testament, leading into Jesus's ministry and asked him to die on your behalf till he rose again to prove that the debt was covered and sealed for us. That is how mighty your God is, that he defeated death and sin and the powers of hell and anything that we possibly can't see or understand that is how mighty our God is and he wants to be mighty for you and work in your own life for you today so anybody who's watching this maybe you haven't fully given your life to Christ yet and I just want to encourage you that this is the time this moment in this place whether it's in your living room in your PJs or it's in your bedroom under the covers watching this on your cell phone God is mighty to save you he wants to work in your heart and your life just like he worked in my heart and my life. And he wants to be mighty to save for you. And if you have already turned your life over to God um, and you've been walking with him for a long time, like maybe I was, God is still mighty in your circumstances. And God wants you to respond in faith. God wants you to take this circumstance that you're in and surrender it over to him. He wants you to have faith and to respond in a way that Hagar responded, to know and acknowledge who God is and to grow in intimacy with him in the middle of your circumstances. So I'm gonna lead us through a prayer right now in this time. Um, the first prayer, is actually going to be a prayer for anybody who hasn't committed their life to God and wants to. And the second prayer is going to be a prayer for anybody who has already committed their life to God that maybe needs some surrendering to happen and for the God who's just mighty to save to work on our lives. So if you'll just bow your heads with me and we'll go ahead and pray. And hopefully after this, uh, you can grab somebody and respond. And I'll give you a few ways that we can respond after this prayer. So, ah. Uh, Father God, thank you for being a perfect and awesome Father. And this prayer is just gonna be for anybody who doesn't believe in you already, who wants to trust that you are God who is mighty to save in the middle of their circumstances. And I just ask for those people to join in prayer with me at this time. And for those who have already been saved to just pray for those salvations to be happening right now. 
God, I know I'm a sinner and I know I've messed up in my life. I acknowledge who you are, that you are a God who is mighty to save me, that you sent Jesus to die because I couldn't do it on my own, God. That you sent Jesus to die for my sins and that he rose again for my salvation and to save me and my life so I could forever be in heaven with you. God, I want to be in heaven with you someday. I submit to a God who is mighty to save me, who has a plan for my life, and I want to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, God, I want to pray another prayer for those who already know you, who already call you Father God, and I just need some time of surrendering. And I'm just going to let those people repeat this prayer after me that, God, I know I'm a sinner and I know that you've saved me in my life, but God, there are things in this life that I can't handle. There are mountains I can't climb. There are rivers that are too deep for me to cross on my own. God, I'm asking for the God who is mighty to save to take control. I can't do these things on my own. God, I am giving these things to you at your feet. God, that I can't do them. Whatever it is that is on my heart or on my mind that is keeping me further from you, God, I want to be a person who has faith and looks at you like El Rai. I want to know that you are a God of seeing who wants to radically change me and to bring me closer in spite of whatever is going on in my life. I submit to you and I love you and I want to take more time to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you so much for just giving this time for me to share with you a little bit of my testimony and what I think God is trying to do. Um, if you are a person who committed your life to Jesus for the first time or maybe had some stuff that you needed to surrender in your heart, I am encouraging you to not leave this moment between you and your TV screen or your phone screen right now. I want you to text someone in your life that you trust. Maybe put it in the InterVarsity group chat. Maybe text a really good friend and just to say, I committed my life to Christ or I just surrendered something that I was going through. Bring people in to let them support you through this time. You don't have to be isolated and you are not alone. Have faith in the God who sees you. Have faith in a God who's bigger than your circumstances and have faith in the God who is mighty to save you. God bless you guys and stay safe out there. All right, Sarah, well, thank you so much for an amazing video. Uh, me and Otis, we really thought the world of it, and we're just so excited to keep partying with you guys. Uh, so make sure to hop over into the Discord, and let's keep after going. <laughs>